All right, morning, everyone. So I'm going to start with a, uh, an apology. I haven't had a chance to finish up the assignment handout. It's been a pretty crazy week, but um, I will. I promise you I will have it by the end of tomorrow, so you'll have it before the end of the week. Um, I mean, we've already discussed, basically, what it's going to be about, you know, doing 3D um, stuff in OpenGL to sort of simulate this rough idea of having a a training simulator and it will be pretty basic stuff like moving one object onto another object and, and so on and so forth. But it's just about getting, I just need to, I know all the parts and I just need to put them in a coherent, pardon me, a coherent order. All right, um, otherwise we will pick up where we left off. We actually don't have too much left um, in the graphics part and then we're back into Unity. So it will hopefully tie in quite nicely with the um, tie in quite nicely with the, the timing of the assignment that we'll be getting into the stuff that you need to know. Um, or we've cover, covered a, a chunk of the theory, but we're getting into the practical stuff uh, that you need to know as we go. All right, so just to recap from Tuesday, um, we finished off some stuff about transformations, and then we talked about scene graphs and how that's what Unity handles, or how Unity handles things internally anyway. Um, so fortunately, a lot of the stuff is sort of the hardest parts taking care of it for us. It's just a matter of us positioning things and thinking about the relationship between objects as far as how to build that hierarchy. Uh, we talked about cameras and view volumes. So how to position the camera. We talked about orthographic and perspective projections. Um, proje perspective projections is 99% of the time what you're gonna wanna use orthographic um, is mainly for uh, engineering sort of stuff when you wanna main, like be able to measure stuff and make sure that it's accurate. Um, but I also showed that example in Unity, how you can change in the scene view from perspective to orthographic, or they call it isometric, um, which makes it much easier to position items in 3D, which is handy. Um, and then we started on lighting. So we were just uh, sort of talked about this a little bit towards the end, um, then sort of ran out of time before we had a look, had a look at any proper examples. but. So we had a, we had a chat about um, the various or how the rendering engine tends to uh, determine the color a pixel should be. So it's looking at things like the geometry of the object, the characteristics of the light, the materials of the object, and what illumination and shading models the rendering engine uses. And we looked at some basic examples, so a simple illumination model where the the color that you see reflected is the light color multiplied by the material color. We talked a little bit about ambient lighting, diffused lighting, and specular lighting, and then we finally got to an example and we, I confused you all by making you think that this was a yellow sphere when it was actually a gray one. Okay, so there are several different types of lights that, I did used to have a slide which better illustrate them, but. Um, the, Oh, really? Okay. It's all part of my illusion. Uh, yeah, so it is, it is a gray sphere with blue lights on it. Okay, so the, there's basically um, four main types of lights that we are concerned with. And actually, I might pop into Unity to illustrate these because they're easier to set up than in um, processing, and it shows the same thing. They're the same thing anyway. Okay, so let me actually let me get, I'll just do a cube actually so we can see it a bit better. So we've got a cube in here. Um, this is just our default scene as per usual. Um, we can see that we've got a camera and a cube in here. So I've deleted the light, and you can actually see that um, there's still some lighting in the environment. And that's because Unity has sort of default scene lighting um, on every scene, just so that if you delete the light, everything doesn't disappear. So I haven't actually made mention of this in the lecture slides, but let me see if I can remember where it is. They move it every time. Um, so it looks like if you're using Unity 2018, it's under rendering light settings. And you'll notice if I open that, it pops up a new window and there's a bunch of stuff which is half of it even I don't understand. Uh, but the top one we can see, in the top scene, we can see that there's an environment lighting and there's a source which says skybox. So that's basically the skybox that we have. So a skybox is effectively a, a, a graphics term when we put kind of a, effectively a, a large box around everything in the world so that rather than just having a flat color when we look out, it looks like we're looking out to the horizon or whatever. 
So this is the skybox here that Unity provides by default. So it looks like, you know, there's sort of, there's a sun in here somewhere. Oh no, maybe that's the light source. Um, but you know, it goes from dark blue up into the top of the sky to sort of um, yellow on the horizon, so it looks like the sun's setting, and then there's like a sort of brown ground. So I can change that, we've set, looked at this before, in the um, camera we can change from skybox to solid color, and that will, on, in the game view at least, that will change it from looking like the skybox that we just saw to a solid color. But there is also, um, lighting which is caused by the skybox. So again if we go into Windows, Rendering, Light Settings, we can see this lighting window pops up and there's some various bits and pieces we can change in that. And one of them is the environment lighting. So I can change the environment lighting from skybox to gradient to color and so on and so forth. So if I wanted this to be a true, um, you know, a truly unlit thing, like there's no lights at all, what I can do is I can go into color and set that down to black and we'll see now that my cube is black. There's actually still some uh, lighting which is cast on that. If I turn off the skybox, we might be able to get rid of that completely. There we go. So if I disable the environment skybox material, you'll see that now that skybox, not only has it gone from my scene, so now it's just all gray, but the cube has no lighting, shading, definition on it. That's, this is, by default, the Unity has, has that skybox material which casts some light on it, but we can turn that off if we want. It's kind of like in um, processing, so if we open up, let's see if I can find an example. Um, if we open up an example like this one, so this is a, we'll be looking at this example a bit later, a cube with the, I don't actually know whether it is the Shanghai Tower or the uh, one in Montreal or something, it's a tower somewhere in the world. Um, if we look through this, we'll notice probably that there is no light source in there, but the uh, 3D model is still lit. And that's because, like Unity processing, if you don't explicitly say um, that there should be a light source, it will throw one in there for you, just so you can see something, because otherwise it just comes out as a black, black square. Um, don't know how I can actually turn that off though. Oops. Okay. So I'm not 100% sure how to disable the default light in Unity and, uh, and processing. If you do put in your own light source, it will get rid of that default light and allow you to use your own, but um, by default they have a light source in there simply so that you can see what you're doing. You don't just end up with a black cube because it's unlit. Likewise with Unity, by default, it will give you the environment skybox, um, which we can, if we want to, disable uh, by going through this light settings and turning that off and then turning the ambient color to black. Okay, so this is a truly unlit environment now. Um, if we made the camera background black as well, we wouldn't see that cube at all but we can see it if we've set the background color to anything else because it is completely unlit and solidly black. Okay, so anyway, by default, Unity will throw in a directional light. So if we go to game object, we can go to directional light, and you'll see we have this light source here that has a position, so I can move it around the space, and it has an orientation, so I can rotate it, and you can see the little icon there, whoops, looks like a, the sun and it has some yellow lines which are pointing out in a certain direction. So the, the way this works will depend, actually just one other thing I forgot to mention. So for you guys, you might see the, um, where's my light gone? You might see the icons as being massively bigger to the point that they're kind of unwieldy. What you can do is you can go into gizmos and just click on 3D icons to uncheck it and then they'll always be the same size, they don't get larger. So it's kind of like the difference between isometric and orthom orthographic views, uh, sorry, orthographic and perspective views in that with 3D icons checked, they get bigger and smaller as you get closer and further away. Um, if you disable that, they always stay the same size. I prefer working in this mode because otherwise, you know, when you're moving, working with a camera or a light source, often you want to get quite close to it to see where it's going and then you get like that and you can't actually see where the light's pointing. So. Turning that 3D icons off I find is a slightly easy way to work. Okay, so anyway, 
Um, we have a light, so again, it's just a game object, but it has a light component attached. Like any game object, it can be moved, it can be rotated, and it can be scaled. Um, what these actually mean for a light source is slightly different depending on what type of light, so light source it is. So for example, with the directional light, you can see no matter where I move it, the lighting on the cube doesn't change at all. Also, if I scale it, it doesn't make any difference either. But if I rotate it, you can see that the lighting on the cube does change. And that is because a directional light, which is the default one Unity gives you, it's, I'm going to try and use some metaphors to explain how these, what these lights are like. Um, well, I suppose similes is more accurate. Um, but they're not perfect. So a directional light you can think of kind of most like the sun. So we think about the sun as being a point which is kind of infinitely far away um, and it shines on us in a certain direction. So it casts shadows and stuff like that. But if I go, uh, you know, if I'm standing on top of a building versus standing on the floor or on the ground, I don't, you're not going to notice a huge amount of difference in how brightly I'm lit. And that's kind of the same thing for the directional light. So I can position a directional light in space, but it doesn't actually affect anything because it's like the sun. The sun's so far away from us that it actually, if I'm standing a meter closer to the sun or a meter further away, you're not going to notice a huge amount of difference in how much I'm lit up. So for directional lights, the position actually makes no difference. So I can move this around, I can put this wherever I want, and it's actually going to affect the light or the cube in exactly the same way. Even if it's on the other side of the cube from which way the light appears to be going. So it's actually, if we jump into orthographic, we can see this is actually to the bottom and to the left of it, but it's still actually lighting that top right side, which is kind of counterintuitive. And it's one thing where Unity's thing of everything as a game object sort of falls apart because a game object has to have a point in space. But you'll notice if we look at um, in processing, the way we create a directional light is we give it a color and a direction. So in processing, we actually don't have a position for a directional light. Every directional light is effectively in, at infinity distance from us. And that's the same here. So even though this is to the bottom and to the left, the fact that it's pointing down this direction means that effectively it's actually at an infinite distance in that direction. So the only thing that matters is the direction that it's pointing in that case. So it's a little bit hard. And you're more than welcome as well if it's easier um, for you to think about to move it so that, okay, we're going to put this, this is going to be shining on the top left of the cube, so I'm going to move it to the top left of the cube. And that way, at least for, my, for our real world understanding of how lights work, that seems right. But it actually doesn't really matter where that light is if it's a directional light. So you'll notice in the light game object, we have a few things. There's type, directional, and it's got some other ones as well that we'll talk about soon. Uh, it has a color, so I can change the color of the light. At the moment it's white, but I can change it to like red or whatever. And we'll notice as I change the color of the light, the color of the cube will change accordingly. And that is due to the, the, um, the rendering library which has been used by um, Unity, which is uh, probably the phone blends shader by default. But um, it's, you know, the the thing that we looked at the other day of, um, sorry, I'm completely stumbling over my words there. Um, what we were looking at the other day, that simple illumination model of material texture times light texture is kind of a very basic abstraction of that. So this cube is white or gray, I suppose. So that's the color of it. Um, and the light is purple. So gray and purple is kind of just a slightly duller purple than the light color. Likewise, we can also see the color of the, the icon changes, but that's kind of irrelevant. So I can change the color of the light and that will affect how objects in the scene are lit. Um, actually, for a better example, let's grab three, let's grab these bats and throw them in there and scale them all up. So each of these ones is a different color. Bat green, bat red, bat violet, bat yellow. All right, so if we make our light uh, white, that didn't actually change those at all for some reason. Uh, 
Oh, okay. So we'll come back to that in a second. Just, uh, sorry, I'm going to do something and then I'm going to come back and explain it at a later date. Um, Okay, there we go. So there are our bats. So we have our green bat, our red bat, our violet bat, which doesn't really look that violet. It looks kind of just a shade of green. Is that right? Hmm, apparently so. And I suppose the body of it is more violet. Should we rotate more around so the face? <coughs> so his wings are violet, his body's green, which is confusing. Okay, so green bat, green wings, red bat, red wings, violet bat, violet wings, and yellow bat, yellow wings. So if we change our light color now, we can see that they will, if I make it red, for example, they will all be red, but the amount of red will be different depending on their colors. So this was the yellow bat, so obviously yellow is quite a light colored, the way we generally think about colors, and so it's taken on a lot of the red. The green, green and red are, uh, what's the word, not complementary but the opposite colour. Um, so you add the two of them together and they tend to get a little bit darker. So we can see that the green bat is slightly darker than the red bat. Likewise the purple bat is slightly darker than the, sorry, the green is slightly lighter than the yellow and the violet is slightly darker than the red because red and red is going to show up fairly obviously red. So we can change all these colours and you'll notice while the bats do take on the appearance of the colour they will be, it will be slightly different. So that's probably a better example where we can see the green and the violet are quite different color, noticeably different colors now from the yellow and the red because of how those colors have mixed together. Okay, so that's a directional light. Um, what else have we got to change? So the type, color, we can change things like the intensity. So intensity is as you would expect, just how bright that sun is. So we can go, or that light sources. So one is by default. But if we want it brighter, I can increase the value and I can keep going until it's basically so bright that everything is just completely washed out and has just taken on the color of that light. Uh, there are some other things we can, we can change around, various multipliers. Uh, we can turn on shadows if we want. Now, I'm gonna try and do this, but I never seem to have much luck when I do a live demo of it. So I'm gonna put on a, put a plane down because the shadows need to land on something. And then on the light, I'm going to turn on hard shadows. There we go. So I've put a plane down. So we need something for the shadows to land on because even though it looks like we have sort of the ground here with the grid, there's actually nothing there. So there's nothing sitting on that ground. It's just there for illustrative purposes only. So what I've done is I've put a, um, let me change that light back to something a bit more white. I've put a, a plane down, which is what's going to be what our shadows are cast on. Um, and then I have, uh, in the directional light, I've turned on hard shadows. So there's a few different types of shadows we can use. So you can see hard shadows look like this. They're very, you know, sort of sharp edges and stuff like that. Um, we also have the option for doing soft shadows, which will blur them out and make them look a little bit nicer and a little bit more realistic. And there's various settings we can change. So we can change the shadow strength, which sort of describes almost like how much other light there is in the scene. Um, and yeah, change all those bits and pieces. Also shadows are, will cast on any object, which if we have a look at the plane, bless you, uh, we'll see in the mesh renderer, it has a button or checkbox for receive shadows. So anything which has the receive shadows checkbox on, shadows will land on. So you can see if I check and uncheck that on our uh, plane, we'll see the shadows appear and unappear. Likewise, if we look at our cube, it also has receive shadows on it. So if I move one of these bats, you'll see that its shadow will also cast on the plane. And that's all coming from the direction of the light. So you'll notice again, like with the, um, you know, the, the how the light affects everything, the direction of the, or the shadows cast from this light depend on only the direction of it. So as I move this light source around, it's not actually changing where the shadows are falling. 
the only thing that Unity really cares about in regards to the shadows is the direction that they're going. Um, cool. So the other thing, actually, I, I mentioned that we have this uh, receive shadows. We also have cast shadows. So at the moment, you can see that this cube is casting a shadow on the ground. I can change that to off, and that way it won't cast shadows anymore. And there are some other options in there that I'm not going to go into because on and off are usually the two that you're going to worry about. Likewise with the bats, we can go into their mesh and you can see even though this is a whoops, this is a mesh renderer and this is a skinned mesh renderer, you'll see they have the same thing. So they have cast shadows, so bats cast shadows and I can turn that off and on so that will say whether that bat will cast its shadow or not. And we can also turn on and off receive shadows. So if there's another object which is casting shadows on this bat because receive shadows is turned on, it will um, receive that shadow as well. Okay, so that's a directional light. So directional light, the important thing to remember is that uh, effectively it's a light source at infinity. So the only thing that matters is, is its direction and then we can play with the color and the intensity and all that sort of stuff. Um, so in processing, I didn't mean to open that, in processing, we have the same thing. Uh, when we create a directional light, all we're doing is we're passing in the color that it should be and the direction that it's pointing in. And that direction is a normalized direction, so it should always add to one. Well, the, the x, y, and z, x, y, and z values should add to one or negative one, effectively. So in this case, the directional light is, uh, well, the color is that, but the um, direction is one, zero, zero. And so what that means is that it should be pointing, one is positive in the x-axis, it should be effectively sitting at an infinite direction in the negative x-axis pointing in the, in the positive x direction. So it's infinity distance over there and it's shining in this direction. If it was shining from underneath, it would be um, one negative one, oh, sorry, zero negative one zero, which would be up. If it was down, it would be zero one zero. If it was pointing to the right, it would be negative one, zero, zero, and so on. So the numbers should be uh, between zero and one uh, for this, this direction because it's not a position, it's a vector. It's telling it which direction. So that's one, zero, zero, that's negative one, zero, zero, that's zero, one, zero, that's zero, negative one, zero, that's zero, zero, one, and zero, zero, negative one. And you can do any combination of that. So if I wanted, um, if I want it to be from the bottom right, I could say, well, that should be one and that should be negative one. It should add to one. So we'd do 0.5 and negative 0.5, zero will give us that upwards direction. Usually most of the time, even though they should add to one, um, if they don't, it's fine. So we probably could put in there one, negative one, zero, and it would just say, okay, well, that's a, it's a normalized vector, so if it's greater than one, I'll just shrink it down to one. The important thing is the ratios between these three numbers. So I think we had an example basic light spot. Um, no. Basic light spot. So this was the example we looked at with the cube of the sphere, sorry, which may have been blue or it may have been gray or it may have been yellow. And I have a feeling in here we have one directional light and this is the light which is lighting the bottom of the sphere. So just to confirm that, if I comment that code out and rerun it, you'll notice that now there's no light source at the bottom of the sphere. There's only the two lights here. So those six values that we looked at, so the first three are the color, so 51, 102, 126. And if we open up our color selector and punch in those numbers, 51, 102, oops, 126, you'll see that that's the color that it's using to shine on the bottom. Oop, can't get both those in there at the same time. That's annoying. So that color lit from the bottom should be that color there. And then the second part is the direction it's pointing. So as I said, X, Y, and Z, and that is the direction. So negative one is up. So zero, negative one, zero is the light pointing from the bottom. So I could, if I wanted it pointing from the top, I could change that from negative one to one. 
and now the top of the sphere will be lit. Or if I wanted it to be pointing from the front, I could have zero, zero, is it negative one or positive one? Negative one will light the um, sphere. So now the, the light is at an infinite distance in front of the sphere, pointing directly at the sphere. So we can see the full shape of it now. Or I can have it pointing from left to right by changing the X value. And so now it's lit from the, the left hand side. Okay, so that's a directional light. Um, that's the one that Unity gives you by default. Uh, so there's two other ones. So let me get rid of my directional light here and let's throw in a point light because point light is probably the one that we as people are most familiar with, although that's not actually, no, no, there we go. So a, a direct, the directional light is probably best to think of as like the sun. It's a light source which is an infinite distance away. So it doesn't matter how close it gets to things because it doesn't light them up anymore. A point light is more like a light bulb. So if you imagine you pick it up with your lamp with your light bulb in and move it around the room, that's the effect that we're going to get. So a point light, the position matters. So you can see here, as my point light moves around, um, it's going to light things up as if I'm walking through this environment. I'm not quite sure why it's not. Oh, okay. It's inside the sphere. Um, it's... Yeah, like I'm walking around this environment holding an incandescent light bulb here. So it's lighting up all um, uh, the area that it's, it's sitting on top of. But like an incandescent bulb, light comes out of it in all directions. So if I rotate this round, it actually makes no difference because the light is coming out of this light bulb in all directions. So where a directional light position didn't matter but rotation did, with point light, Position matters and rotation doesn't. So they're exact opposites of each other in that respect. But the interesting thing about um, point lights is that they have a, an er a certain area that they light up. And in, in Unity, that's called the range. So at the moment, this range is 10. I can change that to a different number. So if I change it to 100, it's like a much brighter light. If I change that to 1, it's a much dimmer light. And I have to get a lot closer to something before it finally actually lights up. Um, we do have this sphere out here which gives a rough indication of actually how far the light goes, uh, but in this case because the intensity is quite low, um, it doesn't, we don't actually notice it all the way out. So for example, if I set the range to 1, we can see the, it appears like there's actually only a very small um, light area here. But in fact, what's happening is that everything within, within this sphere here, or if we're just looking at the ground plane, everything within the circle is lit by this light source. It's just that its intensity is so small that it only appears to be a small part. So what I can do is, in addition to increasing the range, which will change how far the light goes, I can change the intensity, just like I could with the directional light, which will increase the, increase the, the brightness of the light but still within that range. So if I set that to something really massive, you can see now that everything within that circle is now lit full brightness, but nothing outside that circle is full brightness. So those two things, the range and the intensity, sort of work together to determine um, how much or how far the light will go and also how bright the light is within that area. So it's kind of one of those things that you want to have a play with a little bit. If you have the, the range too low and the intensity too high, you'll get these really sharp edges of a light. If you have the range too high and the intensity too low, you'll get a nice even spread, but you don't light anywhere near as far. So this is the limit of the light. You see that you don't light anywhere near the, the limits of it. And again, we can change the, the color of the light, so we can have a, a spooky red or spooky green light to, for our bats to play around in. And yeah, they will, again, we can do things like casting shadows from that light source. Um, although it's gonna be, okay, so for some, oh, there we go. So that, the cube is casting a light shadow, or I think the light is too close to the bat. So there we go, we can see there's a, a light source or a shadow from the bat on the cube if I move that up a little bit. There we go, we can see the shadows from the bats on the ground and the shadow of the cube. 
Um, again, again, we can do hard or soft shadows depending on what we want to, what experience you want. So just one thing about the hard and soft shadows, you might be wondering why would we ever use hard shadows which look like that over soft shadows which look a little bit smoother and nicer. And it's purely because um, soft shadows take more computation. So if we're making mobile games with like lots of objects with um, shadows, hard shadows will be faster to render than soft shadows. Okay, so that is two of the uh, light sources. There's one more I wanted to talk about, and that is the spotlight. So a spotlight, if a, um, if a directional light is like the sun, and a point light is like a, an incandescent light bulb, then a spotlight is like a torch. So a spotlight is, as you would expect, a light where you can move it around and point it at stuff. So in this case, a point light, only the position matters, the direction doesn't. A directional light, only the direction matters, the position doesn't. A spotlight, both of them matter. So we can see the lights, let me increase the intensity of that a little bit so we can see a bit better. So you'll see as I move the spotlight round, it's moving and shining on various objects. There's my bats there. But I can also rotate it to change the direction that the light is pointing at. So I can point it down so that it's lit. A couple of the bats. And the box, there we go. So now a couple of the bats are lit and the box is lit. So the spotlight has um, the position and the orientation matters. Likewise, it has a few other things or it has some other variables we can change. So again, there's the color. Again, there's the range, which is like the spotlight. So you'll notice as I change that range value, it will show how far the light rays come out of that light. But it also has the spot angle, which is how wide the spotlight is. So if I make it as large as possible, it acts kind of like a, uh, a point light. If I make it very, very small, it's kind of like a laser beam. So it's just lighting a very, very small, um, very, very small area on the, on the map, so or on the ground. So the, the spot angle allows us to change effectively how wide that beam is coming out of it. And then we've got all the usual various things. We can change the color of the spotlights and change their intensity and turn on shadows or whatever um, to get that effect. Uh, so processing also has ambient light, um, which is the fourth one here. And to get the equivalent of ambient light in Unity, we go back to our light settings thing we had before, and we can just change that environment lighting from color to uh, something else. So this is effectively the ambient light. So this is ambient light is the light which exists even in the absence of light you can almost think of. So if we covered up all these windows in the lab, there'd probably still be like a, it wouldn't be pitch black in here, there'd probably still be a very small amount of light that is leaking through. That is the equivalent of ambient light in, in the real world or the closest sort of approximation we have to ambient light. So in processing ambient light, you just set with an RGB color. In Unity, we go into rendering light settings and we can change the environmental lighting color to be whatever we want. So we could just have it, if we don't ever want it pitch black, we could just have it a slight gray color. So even the back of this cube now, even though it's not lit by anything, it still has a sort of light gray color. Point lights, uh, we have talked about. So in Unity, um, we create the point light and we give it a position and a color. Likewise in processing, we give it a color and a position. Directional lights, we give it a color and a direction as we can do in processing. And spotlights are just a little bit trickier in processing than in Unity. Uh, in Unity, we give them, pardon me, we give them a um, position and orientation. We can change the range, the spot angle, and the intensity. And in processing, we give it a color, a position, and a direction. And then that has an angle and a concentration. So the angle literally relates to the spot angle, and the intensity more or less maps, or the concentration, sorry, more or less maps to the intensity in uh, Unity. So these four things are um, available for you in both Unity and processing to use. If we look at, go back to our processing example, 
we'll see that they have used a directional light for that one on the side or was on the bottom. And then there's two spotlights, the orange spotlight and this sort of whitey blue spotlight that I control. And all they're doing in those ones is moving the position of the, so that's color, position, uh, direction, and then angle and concentration. So you can see the, the main difference between these two, the colors are different. The X and Z are the same, but the Y changes. So this one for the yellow one, the Y position, so it's vertical position is always at negative, uh, sorry, is always at 160, whereas this one, it depends on the mouse position, which is why it moves up and down. The direction of them is both the same, zero, zero, negative one, so they're both spotlights which are being held effectively like that, being pointed at the screen, and then pi divided by two and 600 describe the uh, angle, so how wide that spotlight beam will be, and the intensity or concentration within that beam. Cool. Does anyone have any questions about lighting? point in time. Um, That's right. <laughs> yeah, so what's, um, so there's, there's Unity because it's a more, um, you know, sort of something that people use for commercial stuff. You can check the static, static box up in the top corner on lights. And what that should do, I don't know if it's going to do it in the editor or not, is, yeah. So, um, okay, so if I don't have static checked, and in fact, in every, every, you'll notice every game object has the static button in the top right-hand corner. What static means is effectively this object is never going to move in the environment. Um, or, you know, pre-compute everything and then just store that value. And the reason for that is if, you know, doing things like light computation, is quite expensive to do. And if the light's never moving and none of the objects that it, it does light ever move, then you can just perform all those calculations once, save the result, and then just use that every time. So you'll notice if I move the spotlight around, it's gonna change how the lighting looks. Uh, likewise, if I, if I move these bats around, you'll see that the lighting changes. But if I don't really care about that, like I just want to have this nice lighting effect on the ground and I don't want it to really react, especially if I've got shadows or something turned off, I can check static on the light. And then you'll notice when it, okay, why is that not working now? Um, that's static. Okay, so for some reason that worked before, but it's not working now. What it should be doing is that, and maybe it only happens in the editor, it will do all the pre-computations for that light source and then anything which moves within that light source, let me see if that happens there, no. Anything which happens in that light source will be, um, will not update as, as time goes on. So basically you can mark things as being static if you know they're never gonna change effectively in Unity. And it's really one of these things that be only sort of becomes a, something you need to do if, when you get to the stage of optimizing your program. So it's running too slow, you can start so you activating. You would use the same memory. What's that, sorry? You would, you would, you would usually use the same memory. In the yeah, exactly, exactly. Or either, probably not so much memory, but probably if your game's running really slow, um, you know, you can turn it on. Certainly I, I can probably count the number of times I've had to make things static on one hand. Um, because, you know, there's lots of other things you can do to optimize first. If you're doing like a, a really high resolution game, like, uh, you know, remaking Grand Theft Auto with like tons of buildings and detail and stuff, yeah. then you'd probably want to start making things static because it just means that Unity will do a whole bunch of pre-calculation uh, pre and then use those values rather than computing it every single frame. Um, yeah, good question though. Okay, so there is one other thing that I wanted to talk about, and it sort of was segues. Oh, actually, was there any other questions at this point in time before I go into this? Well, I have that. Yeah, yeah. Because on how you use Unreal, every time that you get some light, you have to choose the light. Mm -hmm. So it will just. The, the, do you have to do the same in Unity? No, so you don't. So you do have the option. So what uh, that goes into. Um, 
so baked light maps. So lighting is quite an expensive operation to compute because you need to basically figure out, particularly if you have stuff like um, shadows or complicated models or complicated textures, because effectively what you're trying to do is for every light source in your scene, you try and calculate for every vertex what the lighting is going to appear like on that vertex so that you can then make sure that it looks um, realistic. So with one light source and only a few models like this, it's not so bad. But you can imagine if I was, if I was making Grand Theft Auto and every car had a set of headlights, for every object we need to look at every car's set of headlights and say, you know, okay, what's the effect of this, these headlights going to be on this object? So what um, Unreal does and what you can do in Unity is you can calculate what are known as baked light maps. So they allow you to basically set up a scene with lots of light sources, calculate how an object is going to look when it's lit, and then you push a button and it actually saves that to the texture of the object. So again, it's a, a way of pre-computing a bunch of stuff so that you don't have to compute it again later. And if you're looking to get like really realist, super realistic things, often using like a combination of baked light maps and lighting is a good way of doing it. So if you were doing, for example, the going back to the assignment of virtual reality simulation in a, in a warehouse environment, you might choose to all your objects bake the light maps for the warehouse so that you can set it up, get it looking right, and you click something, and then it will set, basically compute all the lighting for all the objects which aren't going to move and save it to the textures so that that way, regardless of, or when you run it rather, it doesn't need to say, okay, well, we've got you know, all these boxes in the background of this warehouse that we want to look right, so we have to render them. Because we'll say, well, actually, I've already computed that beforehand. We can just draw them, and effectively, that's just drawing a box with a texture on it. But that texture has been modified by the light maps to look in a certain way. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's something that you can do in Unity, but it's not something that you have to do in Unity. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's probably a way to avoid it in Unreal as well, but I'm not familiar enough with Unreal to do it. Uh, but yeah, certainly, you know, I've a lot of the stuff I've done as part of my company and stuff, we haven't actually had to worry about getting to the point of baking lighting. I think it's probably only a handful of projects, and it's usually when you're doing dealing with something like really um, photorealistic and stuff like that. But even beyond that, like a lot of stuff you can do in slightly more clever ways, which maybe in the break I'll, I'll talk about. Any other questions? No? We're good? Anyone else? Cool. All right, so there's just one other thing that I want to talk to, and it kind of segues us between our two um, topics quite nicely. So, oh, uh, this topic and the next topic. So I grabbed my bat prefab before, and I threw it in there. And, okay, now it is actually working. Oh, I know why. Let's do a ghost thing and see if ghost makes a difference. Okay, so there is my ghost. And you'll notice that when I turn the spotlight on and off, nothing's happening to my ghost. So all my bats and stuff you know, they, and I turn my spotlight on and off, they get lighter and darker, as we would expect. But my ghost doesn't. So my ghost is always staying the same, um, the same color. So, you know, we can say, well, the light doesn't seem to be affecting him for some reason. So what the reason for that is, is if I open my ghost object, we'll see it's got a hierarchy with various things, and I'm looking for his mesh. Um, so in here, we're looking for the skinned mesh renderer, which we've found here. So the, the mesh or the renderer is always the part which makes the thing appear. So if it's a static object like a cube, like my cube over here, you will see it has a mesh renderer. If it's an animated object, like these guys have little animations which they can play, you'll often see it has a skinned mesh renderer in it. Um, but the important part is the fact that it's a renderer. So we can see in here we've got a bunch of various settings that we can change to the mesh and uh, whether it casts and receives shadows and stuff. But one thing that we want to look at is down here you'll see there's a little materials um, label which has a little arrow that I click to open it up. So the way, when we're rendering 3D models, and we're going to come into this in the next section of the slides, but basically 
our mesh, so if we look at our mesh here that we have for our ghost, this is effectively what it looks like. So it's just a bunch of triangles. Um, you know, there's nothing that makes it look like a ghost. It looks more like a weird shaped, um, uh, what are they called, the things that sewers wear, put over their thumbs, they don't prick themselves. Um, thimble, thank you. Looks like a weird thimble. Uh, so it doesn't actually look like a ghost at all. And the reason that, well, the reason that this looks different to this is because it is effectively had a texture applied to the outside and wrapped around it. And in Unity, textures are done using a material. So this object is a mesh. It just has a bunch of triangles which give it a shape. But then this material basically describes what should be put on that shape or how that shape should be lit. And basically everything beyond just the points and the triangles which are connected together. So we can see on this mesh, um, well, yeah, sorry, on the skin mesh renderer, there is one material, ghost brown, and when we look at ghost brown down here, we can open it up, and in fact, I can, if I click on that, you'll see there's a material in here that I can open up, and it has a bunch of properties. So it has a shader, and the shader is a special sort of program which runs on your graphics card that describes how an object should be rendered by your graphics card. So oftentimes that'll have things like, you know, deal with lighting in this way or, um, you know, apply the texture in this way or you can even do some interesting things like, um, yeah, maybe I can show you guys, well, yeah, show you guys some of the shaders we've written for my company where we're like, you know, once, if the object is a certain distance from here, start fading it out and stuff like that. So in this case, this is a very simple one, simple, um, simple shader, and all it does is basically render a texture uh, with um, transparency. So we can see here, you know, I can look under the bottom of his sheet, I guess, for best description. Um, so, you know, that's transparent. In fact, if I can get one of these bats in behind it, you can see that I can see the, the parts of the ghost in behind the sheet. So it's got a transparent um, part, which is this transparent cutout. But the, the, the reason this guy is not being lit is if we look at this first word, we can see it says unlit, which basically is saying that lights should not affect this guy. So in the shader for um, this unlit shader, if you look, well, actually we can, uh, can we? No, we can't. Uh, so you can download all the shaders for Unity um, and you can change them if you want. Uh, and let's alpha test. And let transparent, transparent cutout. So this is the script that you can download from Unity which explains it and I'm not gonna bother talking too much about this because um, yeah, I, I can program shaders, but only barely. So <laughs> I can't write a shader from scratch, but if you give me a shader, I can modify it to do it what I want. So shaders are a, a whole nother different programming language, which is much more basic than processing with C sharp or whatever. So that's why it looks kind of ugly. But in here, you notice that it says lighting off. So effectively it's saying for anything that has the shader, so any material which has this unlit transparent cutout, Lighting off means just forget about lighting. So that's why this guy has, is not affected by lighting because it's using an unlit shader. So what I can do and what I did before in the other one is if I click on this, you see a, a little pop-up menu pops up and there's a whole bunch of different shaders in here we can use. So I could use, for example, um, the standard shader. So the standard shader is the one that Unity usually uses or recommends using these days and it's this massive big shader that does about a billion things. But if I click on that, you'll see that now he actually is lit because the standard shader by default is a lit shader, so it supports um, lighting. So now if I enable and disable that light, you'll see, just like the bats, my ghost is now uh, affected by lighting. You can see some weird things though. Um, what used to be tra like transparent in the bottom is now only sort of semi-transparent. So I can actually see the the bits between, like you can see this very definite line here, particularly here, which shows, um, you know, the, the, sh the full shape of the mesh, even though these parts should be transparent. And that's because the rendering mode for the standard shader is transparent, and I actually want it as fade, 
which will make those parts completely transparent. And now he looks very similar to as he did before, except he's lit by, because we've changed the shader from an unlit shader to the standard shader. And there's a bunch of other ones we might want to use. So some common ones are like the mobile shaders. So if you're doing mobile development, the mobile shaders are simplified versions of the other shaders which have been designed to run really fast. So I could use the diffuse shader on him, which isn't a transparent one. So now we can see um, you know, all those parts which were previously cut out are filled in. So I might want to see if there's something else in there. Uh, not really. Um, and then there's things for the unlit, there's, uh, sorry, for the UI, there's unlit shaders, which are if you don't want lighting affecting something. So if I want, and sometimes this is what you want, you want the sky to not be affected by the lighting in the scene so that even if it's dark and stuff, you still see the sky really clearly. And otherwise, there's a whole bunch of legacy shaders which can do some various bits and pieces that may or may not be interested to us, uh, interesting to us, sorry. So things like self-illumination. So in that case, he produces his own light source and so on. Um, but the main one, the one that you usually uh, will start with anyway is the standard shader because that's the one that as of Unity 5.6 or maybe even 2017 they brought out um, and is the one, the, the one that they recommend using. So it's like a massive shader which can do a ton of stuff but you don't have to do it if you don't want to. So within the shader you'll see there's a bunch of various things. So there's the albedo, I don't know how to pronounce that correctly, but that's basically the main texture. So in this case, if we go into our uh, um, monster pack, you'll notice there's an images folder, and in that we have a bunch of different, uh, the, or like a folder for each creature. And in ghost, you'll notice that there's four images in here. So there's ghost brown, there's ghost green, ghost violet, and ghost white. He looks quite different in his picture than he does on the actual model for some reason. Not sure why that is. Uh, but basically the way, and we're going to talk about texture mapping in a moment, the way these texture maps work is effectively, you can think about it as if you have our mesh, so our 3D model, this is basically parts that we can cut out and glue on our 3D model like stickers. That will give it the texture. So if we have a look at our ghost material, so at the moment this is the brown ghost, I might actually change that spotlight to white, just so we can see a bit better. Um, and I'll rotate this guy around so he's facing the light. So we can see he's a brown color because in his material it's using the brown texture. But if I change that from the brown texture to the green texture, he'll change to green and violet and white. Or what I could do is I can actually also change the color which will allow me to change the color that is displayed on them. But you'll notice that here, the difference between, so say if I wanted to make a white ghost or a green ghost, I could use white ghost here and green ghost here. But if I try and take my white ghost and make him green, you'll notice that the stitches across his mouth are now a green color and his eyes are now a shade of green. Whereas with the original texture that they used, his stitches are yellow and his eyes stay a greeny sort of blue color. So having these different textures that you can use can actually allow you a lot more control over just saying, well, if I make a white ghost, I can actually just change the color here because this will just change the color indiscriminately. So everything gets changed a shade of green. Whereas if we look at these texture maps here, and I, these are just regular textures, so I can just open them up. So it looks like this, this is the part that's going onto his face you can see here the, the white and the green, but then the stitches here are yellow and the stitches here are yellow. So swapping between these two textures isn't going to change the, the color of his stitches. Whereas if I took this and tweaked the shade of it to green, it would make everything a shade of green, including the stitches in his mouth. I'm quite interested to know what the rest of these textures look like, because it looks like there's various levels of ghosts in there, but maybe I think this was the free version and there was a paid version as well. So maybe in the paid version you can get some different types of ghosts. Can you switch the textures? Yep. So, okay, so if we go to, let's do the white one. Um, so I'm going to, I'm using the ghost brown, but I'm going to 
change that. So if I, now I don't have Photoshop or anything on here, so I use a free program called Pinter, which is pretty crap, but it's free. <laughs> um, so I can open this texture in here sometimes, uh, if I get the right one. And I can just edit this in any way that I want. Now, the way this maps onto it is defined by the, uh, the, the person who did the graphics. Uh, no, not so much the format. So it's the, the person who does the graphics will basically say, okay, this part of the texture should go to this part of the model. So in this case, they've obviously chosen to do the side of his face, but it could be possible that instead of doing the side and saying, okay, one side maps onto here, one side maps onto here, they could have done the front and just said this front part maps onto here. So unfortunately, that does limit to an extent what I'm capable of writing or adding to this, but I can put hi there, and if I save that, then go back, Unity will load it, and now you can see hi has popped up on his head. Because of the way the, te the person who texture map modeled and texture mapped this did it, they made it, chose to make it symmetrical. So this side of, the, this part of the texture is used for both sides of his head. So I wrote hi on one side, it appears on, correctly on one side, but because when they created this model in the texture map, they chose to use the same piece and just mirror it, you see that it's now got high written in reverse on the other side of his head. So that really, you know, the way the texture map maps to the model really depends on how the 3D artist has put it together. In this case, I've chosen to do it side on rather than front on. If I'd done it front on, we could have very easily written high and it would have appeared right in the center of his head and it would have looked correct. Um, so that's materials. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that we can do. So, um, and there's things I'm not gonna talk about, there's things that I don't even fully understand myself. But we can throw in a bunch of different, and because these are more getting into the art and 3D modeling side of things. But the albedo, however it's pronounced, is the main texture. But then there's a whole bunch of other textures as well. So there's a metallic texture, which if we have a metallic object, we can use to say how various parts should shine and reflect light. Pardon me. And we can, uh, we can change the slider on that which will affect how metallic it looks. So at the moment, um, you know, he looks kind of, is a little bit shiny, but not so much. It's quite matte everywhere else. If I increase that metallic thing, you'll see now he's very shiny and the light reflects off him as if he was made of a more sort of shiny metallic sort of material. Whereas if I crank that back to zero, it's much more uniformly lit as we would expect. And we can change the smoothness. So if I make him super smooth, you'll notice that there's really no super shiny part. Whereas if I increase that, it will become more and more like he's reflecting something like he's made out of plastic or glass. So we can, yeah, change how smooth he is. And then there's a bunch of other things. So there's normal maps, height maps, occlusion maps, detail masks. Normal maps are actually super cool. Um, So what a normal map does, and we're going to, I'm getting ahead of myself now, but we're going to come back to this anyway, and since we're talking about materials at the moment, why not? So what a normal map is, is a normal map works in conjunction with a shader to fake, whoops, to fake how a, um, the, the texture of an object effectively. So at the moment, we know that the material, the mesh on this guy looks like, uh, the mesh on this looks very simple. It's got 120 vertices and 132 triangles in there. So it's very simple. But if I wanted to give this guy, make him look like he was made out of bricks, I'd have to add a whole bunch more meshes like for each, the shape of each brick and so on and so forth. But what a normal map allows us to do is we can actually fake that by changing how light is reflected off an object. So if I, I've downloaded this normal map here, um, and I'm gonna change the texture type from default to normal map, so we'll talk a bit about texture types soon. Um, and so I can click and drag this into the normal map thing, and now you'll see it looks like he's actually, this one didn't actually go so well. Maybe I'll deal with this brick, uh, this block, sorry. So this cube, likewise again, you'll see it has a material. Um, by default, when I create an object, it has a default material which can't actually be changed. So what I have to do, is I have to go down and create a new material, and then I have to assign 
that material to the object and then I can edit that one. So this is again uh, just a standard shader material. We haven't assigned the texture to it but I could assign that arrow texture that we downloaded the other time or for now I'm just going to leave it blank. Um, but if I apply this brick normal map to it now you'll see that all of a sudden this cube actually looks like it's been made out of bricks. And the interesting thing about this is that it will actually reflect light in a way that is consistent with a brick or like something of this shape. So that all of a sudden this mesh, this actually doesn't have a texture applied to it, this is just the mesh, suddenly looks way more detailed. It looks like somebody's gone to the trouble of modeling each of these individual bricks. But if I actually look at the mesh again, we'll see that again, it's only made up of 24 points, so one for each corner for each of the triangles, and 12 triangles, so two per side. So the mesh is still very simple, but by applying this normal map to it, we've suddenly added a whole bunch of extra detail and texture, which makes it look way more realistic. And that's just part of the magic of normal maps and something that you can do with the standard shader in Unity. There is a bunch of other things you can do. Um, height maps will make it appear to have a, a, a height value. Um, so now it sort of appears to be sticking in and out a little bit differently. Um, and we can do other things as well to it. But not going to talk too much about that for now because I just wanted to show you guys what is capable with materials and shaders. And as well illustrate why these guys were not lit to start with. Okay, so is everyone, that makes sort of sense to everyone, you have these, so you have the way an object will look will depend on the object, it will depend on the lighting, and it will depend on the material which is attached to the object. And the material is one of these things that is quite hard to do much interesting with in processing, but Unity is actually really awesome the way it allows you to edit materials, and it's super powerful even for somebody who doesn't necessarily uh, isn't necessarily an artist. Like, for example, if I wanted to make this, make my ghost wherever he is, who's now, so it looks somewhat like a brick. Um, if I wanted to make him a little bit more spooky, what I could do is I could actually change his alpha value um, from 255 to something a bit lower, and all of a sudden he's now a semi transparent ghost. And to do that, I haven't had to do anything fancy. All I've done is change the color that's applied to him. Um, and there are other things as well we can do, which I'm not going to go into now, um, to, to basically change the effect. But it's the same thing for a bat. If I went into this bat and changed his shader, so at the moment it's opaque, so he's, regardless of what his alpha value is, he will always appear fully coloured, but I can change that from opaque to transparent, and then I can change his alpha value, which will make him fade in and out. And likewise, the cool thing is you can see that his... Um, shadow has also changed its opacity based on how transparent he is. So the more transparent he is, the less dark his shadow is. And if I want to make it so that I can make him fully transparent, I can change that fade value, or change it from transparent to fade, which will allow me to make him disappear completely. Okay, any questions? No, cool. All right, let's take a five minute break there because I'm getting busy. Um, yeah, and then we'll come back and finish off these uh, three graphic slides and then we can get back to Unity. Drew, is this material? Cool, All right. So, as I said, the um, looking at materials and stuff like that is kind of a nice segue because it in Unity at least, because it combines the, the lighting aspects with the, the texture aspects. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, texture mapping, and we're pretty close to the end of these slides now. Um, so just a couple more topics, and then we'll be back at, into Unity. So texture mapping um, is the idea of basically, once we have our 3D model, which is we've defined as a set of primitives, we've created it as a bunch of triangles and points and stuff like that, but really we have nothing more than as we saw in the ghost, um, the ghost model, or the bat model, you know, we just have a bunch of triangles which all connect together and make, you know, some shape. So what texture mapping is, is basically 
assigning for each of those um, each of those triangles, each of those primitives, a an area on a two-dimensional image, which describes where their texture should become should come from. And one easy uh, or one metaphor which works quite well in this respect is imagine wallpapering a house or whatever, or you're wallpapering your model. So wallpaper is by default or by definition, you know, a two-dimensional surface. So it's, it's a piece of paper that you stick to your, your 3D walls or whatever. And it's effectively the same sort of thing when we're talking about 3D modeling. We have a two-dimensional image like this one here. And basically when we create our 3D model um, or when we're, yeah, when we create our 3D model in, in a 3D modeling program or in <coughs> by code and something like processing, all we're going to do is say, for this, tri this particular triangle, it should take its texture from this triangle on the image. So a more uh, simple and straightforward example would be one like this. So we've already looked in processing at how we can create things like um, cylinders. So, you know, if you remember, we talked about sine and cosine to calculate the, the points around the outside. So effectively, what we, if we wanted to make a c very simple Coke can, we could um, we could start with our, we could have our cylinder, and then for each point around that cylinder, all we're going to do is we're going to take some part of a two-dimensional texture and map it to the te to the model. And so that's effectively like if you had a bottle and you just printed out some, something and stuck it around the outside, you'd end up in the same um, the same result. So when we talk about to you, uh, when we talk about texture mapping, so we have a texture, and usually speaking, um, we normalize that texture. So we don't talk about it as this, this image is 400 pixels wide by 300 pixels high. Instead, what we do is we talk about it as being a width of one and a height of one. So we start at the bottom left being zero zero, and then we go to the far right as one, and from zero zero to the top as one. Um, now the reason we do that is that because it makes it quite easy for us to change out textures uh, for different things regardless of things like size and so on and so forth. And there are obviously performance improvements to that as well. So say for example I look at my, my ghost here and I have this texture here uh, which is being applied to, being applied to my ghost. Uh, where is he? There. I might just get rid of that brick texture for now. So here's my texture which is being applied to my ghost. Now, you know, he looks quite good, like, you know, it's a nice, uh, nice, sharp looking clean thing. But the thing to look at is if I open this texture in Unity, this texture is 2048 by 2048 pixels. Um, it's RGB and it's got an elf channel, so it's a 32 bit image. And even compressed, it's still taking up 5.3 megs. So that's, you know, these days perhaps not such a big deal. But running on a mobile phone, 5.3 megs is actually quite a lot. Because that's actually video will be loaded into memory. So it's not, uh, I've got a picture on, saved on my phone, it's 5 megs. That's, I've got a picture open on my phone and it's taking up 5 megs of memory. So if we had like a ton of these different characters and all of them were different, um, all of them were different using different textures, that very quickly adds up. And particularly, this is a problem that I run into fairly frequently, uh, particularly on older devices, so iPad mini, iPad 2. Um, you only get something like uh, 150 megs of RAM before it starts complaining, and then much above that, and the app will just shut it, like, uh, Apple will shut it down. So you might think 150 megs, that's not too bad. We could get... Uh, we could get 30 different characters in here. But then you've also got to take into account that Unity needs some memory and everything, all the meshes need some memory and all the audio needs some memory. And all of a sudden you're hitting, banging up against that upper limit pretty quickly. So we might say, okay, well, it's great that we've got this really high resolution version. Maybe we'll use that on, uh, on PC, but maybe we actually want to do uh, a version for mobile which can work on these older devices. So what I could do is I could just say, okay, well, if 2048 is using 5.3 megs, I'm just going to make a 512 version as well and save that out. And now if I open this, you see it's only using 341 kilobytes. So it's actually, um, 
you know, uh, five times 1,024 divided by 341. So it's 15 times smaller and I've shrunk it, you know, probably not a noticeable amount. But the good thing about it is because we're not using textures, texture sizes, so we're not saying, you know, for this part of the, the ghost's eye, we need to take it from these part, this part of the screen, which is, you know, uh, 1,024 to 1,400 and so on and so forth. We're actually doing it based on this being a normalized image. So we're saying, take the pixel at 0 0.5 to 0 0.51 what I can do is very easily, I can just drag and drop my new, um, my new texture onto it. And so now that's actually using a much lower texture. And you, you may have just noticed if you're observant that the quality, I can't even get them clo get close enough. The quality of the, the ghost has just ever so slightly decreased as I change between those two textures. Um, so this is the high res one. So if you look particularly around his mouth, around the, the stitches and edges, and this is the low res one. So there is a, you know, it is worse, but I'm also extremely close to him. You can imagine if I'm here, that's changing between the two of them. It's barely noticeable, the difference. And I've saved myself, you know, 15 times of my memory on that, uh, that texture alone. So having, uh, representing these things as a normalized value zero to one makes it far more flexible than actually doing actual pixel values. In saying that, I think processing supports both, so you can do both, but Unity by default only supports uh, normalized textures. So I actually just wanted to take a quick aside there um, just to discuss the, uh, what happens when we click on a texture in Unity. So you see, I can click on these various textures and in the inspector it'll pop up and it's got a whole bunch of information regarding this particular texture. So if we're looking at just ghost white, you can see the top thing is the texture type. So if I open that, there's a bunch of different options that I may want to use. So by default, if it's a texture which is being applied to a 3D model, I probably just want to do default. Um, before we downloaded this, uh, this texture here, and I said that it was a normal map, so you've noticed I've changed the texture type to normal map. And you'll notice actually if I flick between the normal map and the texture, this is, or by a default texture, you'll notice that this is 0 0.7 megabytes, but when I change it to a normal map, it becomes 1.3 megabytes. And if you look, you can actually see there's a slight change in quality as well as I swap between these two things. And that is because normal maps are being stored in a slightly less compressed format because we don't want, um, again, you're probably not gonna see a huge amount of difference, but if I swap this between a normal map and a default map, we're actually gonna lose a little bit of the quality um, of that image. We're comparing it a little bit more. And so, you know, you can see there's just a little bit more texture and detail on when it's a normal map than when it's a regular map. It's just a little bit more uh, blurred out. So that's default is for a default texture so anything that people are going to see where they're probably not going to see it so obviously um, and then normal map we also have things like editor or user interface elements so editor and sprite and they're just very high resolution uncompressed because we want our user interface to look really crisp because it always is close to us. For something like a 3D model you know, I can't really tell the difference between, oh, he's lost his texture completely. I can't really tell the difference between a, a low and a high quality texture until I'm sort of at this distance from my 3D model. Um, so yeah, having, having that on default usually isn't a big deal. Then there's other things, there's texture shape. So by default, again, we will be using 2D textures, but you can also, if you're making a, uh, a skybox, you can create what's known as a cube map, which basically splits it up into something which will be wrapped around a 3D object. Uh, we can choose whether this should be an alpha source or not. So uh, in this case, alpha is the transparency, so it's taking it from the um, texture alpha, but I might want it from grayscale. If I have black as uh, transparent and white as fully opaque, 
or I can turn it to none and you'll notice when I go none all the parts of him which were transparent before are now no longer transparent or if I could do from grayscale he's going to be more transparent in the parts which are black than the parts which are white so his eyes are now pretty transparent but the white parts of it are not very transparent at all but because this has been created with a transparent background we can just choose that and use that instead um, alpha is transparency only really makes a difference when you're talking about uh, user interface graphics so it's not such a big deal here so then there's a bunch of other things we can play with um, so let me open up this so by uh, by default this is a This is a 2048 by 2048 image, and there's a reason for that. But let's say it wasn't. Let's say it was a 2052 by 2100 image. And hopefully that I save the right one. Yes, I did. Okay. So this is a... Uh, now a texture which is 2052 by 2100. Because I just resized that and because this is using normalized texture coordinates, you'll notice it doesn't actually look any different there. But if we look down here, so before it was 2048 by 2048 and it was about 5.3 megs, I've now changed it ever so slightly, 2052 by 2100, it's now 21 megs. So the reason for that is that there's actually ways of compressing image data when it is in a certain format, which is known as a power of two format, which allows us to do quite significant compression. So power of two literally means um, two to the power of. So two to the power of zero is one, two to the power of one is two, two to the power of two is four, and then we go 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, and 2048, which was the size of our original texture. So there was, I said there was a reason it was 2048. It is because it is a power of two texture, which means it can be quite heavily compressed. So the fact that this is ever so slightly, and in fact, just to really drive that point home, um, if I undo this back to its normal so this is the normal image I'm going to resize it now to 2049 by 2049 and save that so I've literally made it one pixel bigger in each dimension and it is still 21.3 megabytes as opposed to 5 megabytes so that's actually fine we can load our images in there like if we want and what we can do is Unity offers this if it's not already a power of two like these ones are at 5.3 megs, it actually has a non-power of two option that I can choose, and I can say, go to the nearest power of two, go to the next larger power of two, go to the next smaller. And if I click on two nearest, and then click apply, you'll notice it goes from 21.3 back to 5.3 megabytes, and its size is now being reported as 2048 by 2048 again. Um, so there are some other things you can do. Read, write, enables is only if you're editing the textures in the code. MIP maps, so MIP maps is a um, way of sort of making textures look good regardless of your distance away from an object. So what a MIP map does is, that's there. Say I have a texture which is 2048 by 2048, and say I'm looking at an object which is really, really far away. It seems like a bit of a waste to load in, to use up 5.3 megabytes of data if this thing is only taking up a tiny area of space. So what a MIP map will do is it will also take that texture and it will make a 1024 by 1024 version and a 512 by a 512 version and so on and so forth and keep downsizing them because each one of these is going to be considerably smaller. So again, we can actually do some stuff in Unity to check this out. So at the bottom you see in this default thing it has max size and what I can actually do is I can actually decrease this to force a size. So as long as it is bigger than, the, equal to or bigger than, it will make no difference. So this is 2048, this is 2048, so clicking on apply there will be no difference there. 
But if I change that to 1024, this is going to change it to 1024 by 1024 image, which is now only a megabyte. So we've saved four megabytes. Uh, if we click on that again, it's now 512 by 512. It's only 256 kilobytes. So it's now you know, considerably smaller again. So what MIP mapping is doing is effectively it's computing a whole range of different things and it's only loading in to memory the texture map that we need at that certain point. So again, we can see this guy is now, because it's 512 by 512, it's actually quite low quality. If I go to 1024, it'll be slightly higher quality, 2048, slightly higher quality again. But if I'm this far away from him and change between 2048 and 512, I literally cannot see a difference. I don't know, maybe a few guys are better than mine. Uh, let's see about here. Only just, you know, maybe maybe 1024. Okay, I can't tell the difference between those two. So the idea is that the Unity will automatically swap between the various textures depending on the distance away from the object so that it always appears sharp but at the same time it only uses as much memory as it needs to. So at this point in time, rather than using five megs or four megs memory, we can actually get away with using one meg and there's no difference to the user. And if I move out to this distance, we instead of using five megs, we could actually get away with using 256 kilobytes. And again, the user's gonna have no idea. So what MIP mapping does is it basically creates all these textures and allows you to or automatically flip between them. So to enable that, we just click on generate MIP maps and you'll notice so with MIP maps off, my 2048 by 2048 image is four megabytes. If I check that and then click apply, you'll notice it's gone up to 5.3 megabytes. And that kind of makes sense. If you think about it, this was four megabytes with no MIP maps. This was one megabyte with no MIP maps. This was 0.2 megabytes with no MIP maps. If we add them together, 5.2. And then there's gonna be a small one again the small one again, and that will gradually sort of increase that number. So when we say we add MIP maps, yes, we are increasing the size of it, but it's saving us memory later on, and that, you know, the saving you actually get is considerable, really, for me memory-wise. Um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to talk about in regards to the texture import settings, just because we looked at it before. But the thing, I guess the important thing to take away is the texture type, um, if you're doing something other than a default texture, and you know, using non-power of two textures and generating MIP maps and stuff. Likewise, in the default, we, so we looked at how we can force a max size. We can actually also, we can change the resize algorithm, um, which will give different compression qualities. We can change the format of how we want to store the texture, which might save some memory, and we can change the compression format as well. So I can change it from normal compression to high quality, and that is going to take a little while to recompress. And it hasn't actually saved us or cost us any extra memory. But if I turn compression off completely, again, we're back up to this 21.3 megabytes. So there is an advantage to having compression um, enabled. In this case, I don't actually see a huge difference between compressed and uncompressed. Um, on some textures you will, but it does save us like 16 megs of memory, so it's worth doing. Okay, so back, back to texture mapping. That was a, a bit of an aside as to why having normalized coordinates are quite good. Um, and you'll notice I have U and V mentioned on the uh, on that image there. It's because, well, I don't know why U and V were chosen, but they, I guess, because you have X, Y, and Z used for the 3D coordinates of the vertices, and U and V are, well, it still doesn't explain W, but yeah, we have U and V anyway, and U is usually the vertical coordinate, and the V is the horizontal coordinate. So if I asked you for the UV coordinate for a certain vertex, it would basically be the value between zero to one, which for that vertex is where that texture gets taken from. And oftentimes texture mapping might be called UV mapping or whatever as well. Okay, so let's actually look at some examples of this now. 
Uh, so again, we have some examples down the bottom. Topics, textures, texture quad. It's a nice one to start with. And all this is doing is that, is that same um, tower thing again, but it's just being displayed on a single quad. So, uh, you know, two triangles or possibly even just a, where are we, begin shape. Yeah, so it's literally just a quad of four, four corners. Okay, so how does this work? So uh, processing has a class called pimage which it uses to load images. So you guys might have seen this in some of the um, some of the demos that you tried out. But pimage is basically just a class you call load image, and it will load a file to into that texture, and then you can call like image photo to draw that texture on the screen. Um, so it will load it all in. It's got some various values. So pixels, we can get the pixel color of each pixel. We get the image width, the image height, and we can resize stuff, and we can get a pixel or set a pixel, uh, filter it into grayscale, save it out as a particular format. But in this case, uh, if we go back to processing, you'll see here we, are, we have our P image image, and we're just calling image load. Okay, so presumably it's in Berlin because it's got Berlin on there. And if we go into sketch, show sketch folder, you'll see in the data subfolder we have this Berlin one, and that's the texture that's being loaded. So this is being loaded by processing, it's being stored in this image. We're setting up some, the size of the window and this, the no, back, uh, no outlines. And then we have this, some stuff to set the background and move some stuff and rotate some stuff. And then the important thing though is these line or these lines of code here. So begin shape, um, this could be begin shape quad or whatever, but they've just chosen to leave it as nothing. Um, in fact, if we draw do begin shape quad, it will, prob will hopefully give us the same result. Yeah, there we go. So begin shape quad, and then it's calling texture image. So this image is the one we've loaded before. So effectively what that's saying is get ready to use, load the text, the image texture into memory because that's what we're going to apply to the shape. So within the begin shape method, we call texture image. And then we're drawing out our various, um, our various vertices. So there's a vertex from negative 100 by negative 100 to zero, 100, negative 100, zero, 100, 100, zero, negative 100, 100, zero. So the first three coordinates, as we saw before in vertex, are the x, y, and z. And for the last two, they are the u and the v coordinates. Now, by default, um, Unity does not, uh, sorry, processing does not use normalized coordinate systems, which I think is terrible because everything else does. So what we can do is we can add texture mode normal, which will make these normalized. So at the moment, they've got zero, zero, image width, zero, image height, image width, image height, but I want these between one and zero because honestly that's what every other 3D graphics program does. And if we run this again, we'll see we've now got the same result. So we've got the vertex, x, y, and z position, and then the last two, so this is vertex is an overloaded method. It has one which takes just an x and a y, one which takes an x, a y, and a z, and one which takes an x, a y, a z, a u, and a v. So we're saying for this corner at well, this, pick, this vertex at the corner, negative 100 by negative 100, so this one here, use the texture, or the map that to the texture coordinates at zero by zero. Then for the one at 100 by negative 100, so this corner here, take it from one, so the rightmost part of the image by zero at the top. And then for this one, we're gonna take the Sorry, actually I've got these wrong, around the wrong way. That's the, the first one is the bottom left, then the bottom right, then the top right. So 100 by 100, take the right topmost corner. And then for the last one, for the left topmost corner, take the left topmost texture coordinate. So we're basically saying, if we go back to, actually open that one, open that one, open that one. So vertex negative 100 by negative 100 will be the bottom left, and we're saying take it from 0, 0, which is the bottom left. Then we're going 100 by negative 100, which is the bottom right, 
take it from 1, 0, which is bottom right. For this corner here, 100, 100, take 1, 1, which is top right. And then for this one here, which is negative 100, 100, take it from 0, 1, which is top left. So we're basically saying that maps to there, that maps to there, that maps to there, and that maps to there. And the good thing about 3D rendering programs is we don't actually need to worry about any of the pixels in between. It will automatically figure out what pixel is supposed to go where. So that's a pretty basic and not super interesting example. Um, there are slightly better ones in here. So Texture Cube does the same thing again, but this time big and shape quads, and it's doing it for um, the six faces. So positive, the front face, the back face, the bottom face, the top face, the right face, and the left face. And now we have a cube with this pyramid on all six faces. We could very easily, if we wanted to, uh, do something, tweak this slightly. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. So I'm going to load a second texture in. And then I'm going to do P image text two. I'm going to try and get that to render on half of the faces. Okay, so what's happened here is I have we have three sides, the front the back, the bottom, and the top, and actually all but one face, sorry, um, are being used from this original text, which should be the Berlin. But I have said for the last side, so before we draw the last side, use texture two, which is this UV text squiggly line thing. And what's actually happened is all of these sides have been um, using the UV text. So just, let me just double confirm this before I say it in case I'm wrong. No, there we go. So what we have to do, the texture, you can only call texture once within a begin shape, end shape thing, or otherwise it will apply that texture to everything. So basically you pass in all the vertices, and then when you call in shape, it will say, okay, now I need to render all these shapes using the currently loaded texture. So if you call texture twice in one begin shape, in shape call, the second one you use will be the one which gets used for all sides. So what I had to do there was just add an in shape, so force it to draw all of these sides with the original Berlin text, and then do another begin shape for the side which I want to use the other um, texture on. So you'll notice now we have five sides which have the Berlin texture and one side which has that UV um, texture on it. So we could very easily have a cube with five or six different sides and each side has a different image. We just need to call begin quads texture side in, in sorry begin shape quad texture do the side in shape begin shape quad texture size for each of the individual sides because otherwise it will just use the same texture for all of them. Um, and there are again even more interesting ones. So we've looked at the sphere example before but this time it's the sphere example which has the earth's texture um, displayed on it. Again the earth's texture is if we go to show sketch folder just displayed as a two-dimensional image, and the math for this starts getting a little bit complicated now, because not only are we trying to compute each vertices um, position in 3D space, but we are also trying to figure out whereabouts on the texture that that should map to. And when you get to that point, it's usually time to say, okay, I'm done with processing, we're moving to Unity. <laughs> um, just as a a little aside to that p-image stuff, um, we can actually, so I mentioned that with p-image we can actually, uh, topics, image processing, we can actually get individual pixels, which is kind of nice, so we call uh, 
a dot or a so a is a p image load image and then called load pixels will get it will give us access to the pixels and then that's just a two-dimensional array that we can go through and oh sorry a single dimensional array where if we hit our image which was like this this would be pixel one two three four zero one two four five six seven eight in that order so if we wanted to get say the middle pixel we would have to say okay calculate the width so the width of this is three and the height is three so if i wanted to get the the middle pixel so the pixel which is at two by two we take height times one or height plus uh width no height times width sorry okay i'm completely boxing this up okay so we want to get the the uh pixel which is at the position one one so it's one in the x-axis and one in the y-axis it will be y times height plus x is what i meant to say so y times height so one times height is three plus x is one so we will need to get pixel four will give us that pixels uh color value in there so what that can that means you can go through and get every pixels color value and you can do stuff like this so this is a uh, an example where we're loading this image in here and then we are drawing some lines based on the blueness of the so the distance they are from um, the screen is based on the blueness of the pixel which is kind of hard to visualize and understand but we'll see if it spins around at one point in time we can get some make some sense of it so i'm pretty sure this is the way around it should be so this blue this part here which is sunken quite far back is this part up here which is quite blue and then there are various other um you know the blueness of a pixel is kind of a tough one because uh it's not as humans intensity no there is a way to get the intensity of a of a pixel um the blueness of a pixel is not something which is intrinsic to us so for example purple is half blue which may not be that obvious so that's not actually the greatest example there is another one which is slightly cooler um it makes slightly more sense which is this explode one but again it's slightly more complicated and this one loads this image here and it explodes pixels based on their brightness so the brightest pixels as i move left to right move closest to the screen as i move left to right first and then darker pixels sort of move less quick and i'm not going to go into how this is done but effectively we calculate the get the color for a certain pixel and then it's uh z or its posi z position is calculated as the mouse's position times the brightness of that pixel at that location and so all this is doing is basically drawing a rectangle at a certain z dimension based on the brightness of a pixel so brighter ones move closer or further okay we're almost at the end graphics 3d models so i'm just going to touch on this because 3d model everything we've talked about in processing so far has been basically creating stuff by scratch in unity we don't tend to do that you can do everything we've done here in unity so you can actually create your own quad mesh or anything and actually um, so unity played an april fool's joke uh, for April Fools, which was super convenient timing because it really brought, ties in what I want to say. Um, so they brought out this new. Uh, no. Unity dog. So yeah, Unity, if I can find the assuming it's still here new primitive there it is so unity provides a bunch of primitives so a cube a sphere a capsule a cylinder a plane and a quad 
which are all very basic shapes um, and are used, you know, you probably, if you're making a game, maybe you use some of these, but a lot of the time it's more for prototyping and mocking stuff up. So rather than using a full 3D model of a person, we might just have a capsule to represent a person. But usually decided for April Fools that they were going to include a new primitive game object called dog. So the dog primitive re resembles the cube primitive, however it has the useful addition of four legs, a tail and a head, making it suitable for all dog related scenarios. A dog is more useful in certain cases such as fetching sticks where a cube, sphere or cylinder cannot ac accurately perform these tasks due to their convex nature. Dog primitives are also useful if you require a game object that can be patted, stroked, stroked or snuffled. While you can do this to other types of primitive, the results are inefficient and unrewarding. The dog is aligned with its snoot along the forward z-axis. So, you know, it was kind of just a cute little thing. But they included this script that you can um, include, and in I think... Uh, so we click and drag that script in, and then let's just save this and jump into a new scene. So I, if I go into... Oh, I've already got a copy of dog in there somewhere, apparently. Annoying noise, isn't it? So if I drag that script in there and I now go into game object, 3D object, you'll see there is now a dog. And if I click on that, there is my dog 3D object with its snoot aligned in the Z axis, perfect for petting and chasing sticks. But if I open this dog script, we'll see that it literally is a bunch of X, Y, and Z vertex coordinates. So that's for each vertex in this dog, which we can look at in the mesh. So there are all the vertices and triangles which make up the dog. And literally all they've done is they've put all those X coordinates, all those Y coordinates, and all those Z coordinates into a massive array. And then the last thing is we have a set of integers which represent each triangle. So uh, point zero, so zero, one, and two make a triangle. Point one, zero, and three make a triangle. One, three, and four make a triangle, and so on and so forth. And so they take all of these things and then they create a new mesh and they say, uh, we'll create, get all these vertices out of X, Y, and Z and put them into a vector three, which is a container which contains an X, Y, and Z. So it gets all of those, puts them in this vertex array, and then it says mesh.vertex vertices equals verts, mesh.triangles equals tries, and then does some, we'll talk about normals and stuff in a minute and then cr creates a mesh renderer and it assigns that mesh to the mesh renderer and sets up a, um, so it's, where are we? Creates the mesh renderer, creates the mesh filter, assigns that mesh to the mesh filter and the sets up a mesh collider and everything and uses the standard material for that. So all of this is done in script. So you can d create 3D models in script in Unity, but obviously that's a pain to do so nobody actually does it I've again I've done it probably half a dozen times in my life and that was usually like oh, I want a plane with a hole cut out of it so rather than a cube or a, sorry a flat rectangle I want a rectangle with an inside blank part so very special cases and very seldom used and only because I didn't want to bother Shun and ask him to make that for me so 3d objects are, can be represented in a way uh, in a few different methods so the most basic one is what's known as a point cloud. And a point cloud is basically just a huge, an array of vertice, 3D vertices. So up here, we can see a point cloud. We look at this and we can see it's a bunny. Um, but to a computer, that has no relevance or meaning. It, has, it means nothing to the computer that this point is closer to this point than it is to this point. There's no relationship between these points other than the fact that they're near each other. So you could feed this into a, a computer and you could say, render each of these as a pixel on the screen and you would get something that humans could understand, but you can't assign a texture to it because it has no idea, you know, that actually this, these three points here make a triangle so it should draw the texture on it. Um, it really means nothing to the computer other than the fact there's a ton of points. The next step up is a wireframe, which describes uh, a little bit that, you know, this point is connected to the point next to it and the point next to it and so on. Um, provides some idea of 3D shape, but again, doesn't, it doesn't allow us to do anything like texturing or lighting because these aren't actually triangles or quads or vertices. We just have a bunch of lines connecting points together. And the last one, and the one that we most commonly work with, is a polygonal mesh, 
where we have a bunch of vertices, but all the vertices are made up of a part of a polygon. So they're a part of a triangle or a part of a quad or something. And they will often have surface normals, which we'll talk about in a second, which um, basically define which way, which way is in or inside and which way is outside for a specific um, polygon. And this is the minimum model you need for doing 3D rendering, including things like texturing or illumination or shadows or anything like that, because this is actually a solid object. This is just the, the, the frame of an object, and this is just a bunch of points. So if we want to make a poly polygonal mesh, what we can do is we can get a bunch of vertices. So in our dog example, we have our X, Y, and Z vertices. We have a facelift, which basically dis contains each vertex index for each of the polygons. So these three, make a tri these three vertices make a triangle, these three vertices make a triangle, these three vertices make a triangle. And the last one is a normal list. So a normal list would usually define, so when I'm, when I'm talking about a normal, if we have a polygon like this piece of paper, a normal is a vector which sticks out of it, which decides which is the front and which is the back. So in this case, we have the surface normal for this piece of paper would be pointing out 90 degrees like that. Um, because we live in a real world and objects have two sides, this would also have another normal on the other side, but 3D objects don't have to be that way. And we'll notice that if I go into my dog, if I'm sitting inside my dog, I can actually see through parts of it. So the parts which are on the outside I can see, the parts which are on the inside are effectively invisible and not rendered. And the reason for that is because realistically I'm actually never going to be able to get in, well, I should never be able to actually get inside this dog. So there's no point rendering for each of these polygons two sides of them because I can't see the other side. So the surface normal is used for what's known as occlusion culling. So we can say, well, actually, all the polygons on the other side of this dog I can't see because they're facing that way. So if the normal points away from the camera, just don't draw them. So immediately with this dog example, I can not draw half of the polygons. So I've saved myself a ton of work. Um, it also is used for lighting, so when we talk about lighting, the simplest example of lighting, um, which comes from physics, is that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So as a light ray hits a surface, the direction it bounces out at will be equal to the, if this is the normal, it will be equal to the angle between the, light, the direction the light ray hit it and the direction the light ray bounces out. So this angle here will be the same as that angle there. And the what we're using to measure between is the light angle coming in and surface normal. So the surface normal is used for lighting. And when we'd looked at that example before of having a normal map, what a normal map does is it allows us to artificially tweak the surface normals so that light bounces in a different way than it perhaps should, which gives us the appearance that an object is actually um, has more, more texture than it does. And so to show an example of that, let's take our, um, our material before that we had for this cube. And so, okay, this looks like, you know, bricks. And they actually do reflect light differently depending on how I look at them based on the light which is in the environment. So it actually looks like, you know, there is, and particularly if I actually jump into here and I can increase it's not really a very good example, is it? Um, I can actually increase how much these appear to jut out by changing that number. But if I actually go and have a look at somewhere where I would expect, so, you know, if I was looking alongside the edge of this thing because it's made out of bricks, I'd expect there to be kind of like a brick and then a little channel and then a brick and then a little channel. But if we look along this edge, we can actually see it's still a flat line because we haven't actually changed the geometry, we're just changing how light is reflecting off it by saying, well, actually, this would have a surface normal this way, and this would have a surface normal this way, uh, that way, and 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 that way. And so on my, um, my actual flat object, all I'm going to do is say, well, the surface normal here is here, here it's there, 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 there. And so when light hits it, it will actually reflect in a way that makes it look like it actually is a different shape than it is. And that's all that surface normals our normal mapping is doing. So one thing Unity does which is quite good is it has this recalculate normals function which we can call 
which will tr do its best guess at trying to figure out which direction the normals are facing. So for a polygon, a normal can only go one of two ways. It can either go that way or it can go that way. And Unity has some special magic in it where I guess it probably uh, sums up all the polygons to try and find the center of the object and then assumes the surface normal points in the opposite direction from the, from the center of the object, which is usually a pretty fair assumption to make. So you can provide a normal list, and in fact, if we open up, say, our killer whale, um, the mesh of our killer whale, okay, it doesn't actually say it in there. Um, I thought it did, but apparently not. So often, yeah, I thought it did would say vertices, tries, and normals, but it doesn't. So just ignore that. Um, yeah, so you can provide a vertex list, a face list, and a normal list, or alternately, you can actually um, just ask Unity to load in or to calculate the normals. And you can actually do that on a, a, on a model level as well. So if I open my Killer Whale model and go to the model thing, you'll see there's a bunch of stuff I can change in here. But somewhere down here, it will say normals, and I can choose to import or calculate them. So with my Killer Whale, if I put them out there, currently it is importing the, norm, the surface normal, so these are surface normals that somebody like Shun would have put on the 3D model, which means that it has a nice smooth shape to it. But I could also ask Unity to calculate the normals for me. And we may or may not see a slight difference. So in this case, no. The 3D modeler who made them put the normals in there did a pretty good job putting them in there. But if the 3D model has done a terrible job, we can click calculate normals, and oftentimes um, that will. Uh, change how it looks. And there are various normal uh, parameters we can change as well, which may or may not affect it. So you can see there was a slight change in lighting, and I can change various things like the smoothing angles, which will make the normals more, more or less smooth. So normals are used for lighting and culling for one-sided polygons. A normal is a vector, usually per polygon or per vertex, and it is pointing outwards from the model. So if we had a cup, all of the things would generally point on the outside. If the model appears inside out, chances are your normals are wrong and pointing in the wrong direction. So if you will indulge me for one second, let me see if I can do this. So, um, mesh.normals, uh, vector three. So I'm going to try and artificially does anyone have anything they need to be at in the next five minutes? No. I'm going to try and go through and flip the direction of each of these normals to show you guys. Uh, normals dot i equals. Okay. So hopefully, I get rid of that dog. Get rid of the whale. And hopefully now if I put in a new dog. So, well at the very least the lighting is wrong in this dog. You can see like everything, the parts of the dog which should be, and actually I can probably go back and change if I comment that out. And then do another dog. So the, these are two dogs uh, which have had their surface normals reversed. So you can see the lighting on this dog looks correct. You know, there's a, a light source somewhere which is pointing down from the top. So it's pointing down in this direction. So it's lighting the dog as we would expect. The other dog whose normal ha normals have been reversed in this case um, is being lit incorrectly. So we'll actually notice if we go underneath where it's being basically lit in exactly the opposite direction. So it's like the light is shining from below it rather than above it. So that's, if your lighting is wrong for your, for your 3D model, it could be the normals. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, it didn't. Um, so again, in this case, like, it's sort of just doing this weird glowing thing as I move over it rather than lighting it in a way that I would expect. Um, and lighting the wrong side. So if I put this on this side, the light on this side, it's lighting the, if I put the light on the left side of the dog, it's lighting the right side of the dog, and if I move it to the right side of the dog, it's lighting the left side of the dog. 
Um, unfortunately, it didn't happen with this uh, case, but if we did have a um, did have a shader or material which was doing culling on the the reverse normals, or I had the normals pointing properly in the right direction, we'd actually be able to see the inside of this dog rather than the outside, which you can sort of vaguely make out in this example here. So you see here we have this plane, and we're looking at the top of the plane, so we can see the top of the wing, and it has this missile attached underneath. <coughs> if the, the, we were rendering the wrong surfaces, what we'd actually see is something like this. So this is actually the bottom surface of the wing, and we can actually see the part where the missile connects onto it. So effectively, it's like we're looking inside the wing, but if we then went to the bottom side, we'd see the bottom of the top of the wing. So we'd end up almost sort of always having um, X-ray vision, but it's not something we can control or turn off. We're always seeing the opposite side. So normals can be either per face, so one entire polygon, like I said, can have a vertex, or it can be per, uh, sorry, one entire face or polygon can have a normal, or we can do it per vertex, which means that for each vertex on a polygon, it will have a normal. And this is sort of the difference. If it's at face level, we can really obviously see the entire face because they will all be lit at the same thing. So in this case, at the same intensity. So for this circle here, we can see each individual um, quad which makes it up. Whereas with this one, we've actually said that there is a normal for each of the vertices. So each of these four vertices which make up a quad have its, has its own normal. And what we find is we get a much more smoother blending because one single quad now can actually have a range of different intensities um, blending across it. In Unity, uh, only vertex normals, well, as far as I'm aware, only vertex normals are supported. You can, you can fake face normals by setting all the normals on a single face. Uh, all the vertices on a single face to have the same normal, but um, by default, certainly vertex normals is, are used almost exclusively. Um, so I'm not going to go into this too much because this Unity keeps changing this. Um, they didn't used to have a 3D model loading thing, but now they have this P-shape function, uh, which you can use like this P-shape. Uh, the problem is I don't actually know that there is an example of this either. Um, so you can say p shape dot load shape and then you can pass it in a file name so like an obj is a, a certain file format and that will load it in there and then you can just call shape with the name of the shape you want to draw and the position you want to draw it which is kind of the same as in unity creating an object and then positioning it um, unfortunately i don't have any examples off on hand showing the p, p shape thing uh, maybe if I go tool sketch, sketch folder, maybe if I jump in here and search P shape, we might be able to find one quickly. Group P shape past you, past. Examples, topics, create shape, okay. Examples to create shape, um, primitive P shape. Let's see if one of these loads anything. Nope. nope. So, I mean, we can create them again um, manually. So, this is a two dimensional P shape, so a two dimensional model which has just been created with dot vertex. So, it basically allows us to do our 3D vertex stuff, um, but we can store it all and then we can just call shape dot star. I don't know if there is one which shows an example of loading a 3D model, unfortunately. Um, let's have a little look. No, so that's 2D again. Um, no, I don't think, unfortunately I don't think there is, but the P-shape function can load OBJ files as well, um, which allows you to display them, but that's pretty much the end of the processing lectures, so I'm not going to show you guys an example because your assignment's in Unity and doing it in Unity is literally just a matter of dragging the model into Unity and then dragging it to wherever you want on the screen. Okay, so we finished that. We didn't quite get back onto the Unity stuff today, but that's okay because we will on Tuesday now at least. So I will get the assignment for you guys for by the end of tomorrow.
and then we can have a chat about it on Tuesday. If you have any questions or whatever over the weekend, you're welcome to ask. I will, you know, once again, try and, you know, be as generous as I can with the time that you guys have to do it. So this is the first time, this is the first class which has had Unity as the uh, assignment thing. Every other class has had processing, which means that obviously they can't do as much, you know, 3D graphic stuff because it's a lot harder in processing. So I'm sort of, it will be a, a, an experiment to see how, hard, how far down this we can go. So, you know, I will definitely be grading on a curve for this one. So if you guys do really, really well, awesome. If you all do really, really poorly, you know, I'm not going to say, well, you'll get 10%. I'll say, okay, the assignment was too hard and we're, we're going to need to curve that grade. So, um, yeah, don't stress about it too much, but I will do my best to get something which should hopefully be accomplishable and interesting and achievable and if you guys have any problems please do let me know